Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to uh, talk about an, yet another topic that I just love. Um, I have been doing internet uh, data sharing longer than it has been sexy, and uh, a lot of it is related to DNS, which I also did for a couple of decades before that became sexy. Um, and I have a story to tell about a project that we're embarking on here in Europe that is kind of in the shadow of GDPR, uh, which some of you may love and some of you may hate. Um, but first I want to explain the, uh, the history of this type of sharing, uh, because it is possible that uh, a number of us have really been focused on the ones and zeros without understanding the social implications of what we create. Um, so I want to share some ideas with you here. Um, competition is never uh, a unalloyed bad thing, right? So the, we need competition for efficiency purposes. If you want to look at uh, what happens if you mandate the lack of competition, take a look at the history of any explicitly communist country, and you'll see how low the efficiency of the economy becomes and how low the standard of living will become. Um, on the other hand, I want to say that uh, there are some constructive and some not constructive ways to do all of this. Uh, for example, uh, you could ignore the rule of law and um, uh, do whatever you can get away with. Um, that, you know, we see a lot of that from Silicon Valley, so I'm, I may be speaking out of turn since I come from there, but uh, those are not the people I drink beer with. Uh, you might decide that you are not going to recognize anybody's rights. Uh, in other words, again, do whatever you can get away with and uh, behave well only when regulated by a, a very strong power, which you would then try to subvert with your own uh, uh, political contributions. That, again, is not the kind of competition that leads to greater efficiency and greater standards of living. Um, you might uh, stay away from standards, and we've all got our own pet stories there about some company uh, who appears to have deliberately uh, off-tracked some Internet standards effort because it would otherwise have brought a standard for their competitors uh, to come into a market that they pioneered years earlier, thus uh, obviating their investments and their advantages. Um, so to be really clear about this, uh, I am a capitalist, and... Uh, I see that there are some problems with uh, crony capitalism. Uh, in particular, under capitalism, half the world is starving, and the other half uh, is involved in some form of weight loss program or even uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, so uh, capitalism can be done poorly, and it, it often is. On the other hand, without capitalism, we would all starve. So I am, I am not here to make a political statement that we need to somehow live arm in arm and not compete. Uh, I didn't flip, did it? Oh, here we go. Um, so you can mandate uh, all the cooperation you want, but what you'll get is the minimum that people can get away with. Uh, the, there is a maximum and minimum function for any mandate, uh, and it turns out that enforceability is hard. And so a lot of these mandates are silly on their surface. Um, so if you're going to create uh, laws, treaties, or try to talk a lot about norms, you better be following them yourself, and you better make sure that you're only talking about the ones you can enforce. Otherwise, in the future, when you say, and now we have a new mandate, everyone will just say, well, that'll be about as effective as the last one. Uh, I'll give you an example. It was mandated in 1996 that all U.S. government agency networks have IPv6 by 1999. Um, and every one of them who had any kind of political sway inside the U.S. government got an exemption from that, which is still in effect 20 years later. Um, so that was stupid. And so when they mandated the DNSSEC should also be practiced across the U.S. government. Uh, nobody even paid attention. Nobody even bothered getting an exemption because they knew that it was, no enforcement was going to take place. Uh, this is stupid. We need to not do stupid things. Um, 
Now, a lot of us have heard a comment that on the Internet, uh, censorship is treated as damage, and we route around it. That is often attributed to John Gilmore. Uh, the truth of the quote is probably more subtle than that, but that is what drives us. Um, the CEO of a content delivery network famously got up on stage at DEF CON and gave a talk in which uh, he talked about how his company was not real interested in the intellectual property laws of any particular country because enforcing them would require him to practice censorship. Uh, this was, of course, bullshit. Only governments could commit censorship. It's not a commercial activity. But um, at DEF CON, that line, that was an applause line. People were out of their chairs, happy that somebody was finally saying uh, what they wanted to hear, which is that content wanted to be free, and all of these commercial rights were just uh, holding humanity back. Um, that may not be as simple as they make it sound. Um, now, there are other forms of deliberate non-cooperation, spam, DDoS, facilitation. Um, and what's interesting about the Internet is that uh, various kinds of crime that used to have a, uh, a place. They used to occur in a particular place. Uh, they don't anymore. They're still timely. They still occur at a certain time, but they no longer occur in a certain place. So government uh, rests on the idea of protecting borders. In other words, this is a square of dirt that we will protect with our military, our police, our laws, and so on. And the Internet doesn't really recognize that. It's a little bit like uh, Asian bird flu. People were saying, how come the government can't protect me? Well, it's because birds don't have passports. Um, and the Internet packets don't have passports. Uh, they go where they're sent. And uh, even in China, which invests a gigantic amount of uh, carbon and human effort in the task of protecting their cyber borders, finds that uh, they, they're only making an approximate difference in, in their lived experience. A lot of stuff gets by. Um, pretty much if they can't do it with the money that they've spent, it becomes a proof for all of us that it probably can't be done. Um, in any case, uh, non-cooperation is what we're all here for. This, that's what the hack.lu is about, is us talking about various ways that people who want to steal our stuff are using pretty much our technology to do it. Um, let me talk about some things we can do. Uh, having to do with cooperation among trusted parties. Uh, there are trusted parties, even among competitors. Uh, I have people that compete with me in the marketplace that I nevertheless have data trading alliances with that uh, help both of us, and we're both betting that we're going to get the, uh, uh, the lion's share of the value out of that cooperation, but ultimately it's our customers who will benefit when we do that. The problem is you don't know who to trust, and uh, you are you know, both foxes in the other guy's chicken house in a way. So uh, the cooperation with your competitors has to be done very carefully. But that care, although it is a cost, does not mean that the cost-benefit is pessimal. Uh, in fact, the opposite is true. That care represents a cost uh, that is still less than the benefit. Uh, this is one of the most important things we can all do, is just find somebody who hates us and find a way to share data with them. Um, if we want to move the needle on human security, human history, and the security of our personal information and our autonomy and our privacy and so on. So every attack that occurs um, is, uh, it's like every day you're interviewing for a job. Maybe the job you have, maybe the job you're going to want someday, but uh, it's going to turn out you're going to have a few um, uh, interactions with a few people who will remember whether you were smart, whether you were wise, whether you were kind, or whether you were none of those things. And when they're looking for somebody, you may or may not uh, be on their list of, of people to reach out to. Uh, the same is true about attacks. Every one of them is really a probe. And no matter what its, uh, its stated benefit was, no matter what the motivation of that attacker was for that attack, it turns out that if it succeeds, it becomes the template for future attacks. What we need to then do is to look around at the rest of the Internet landscape and say, um, an attack on one will eventually be an attack on all. An attack on you will eventually become an attack on me. And to the extent that we can cooperate around the nature of those attacks, we will be a little bit stronger against 
the, uh, the, the, the repeats, the, uh, the other attacks that come along using the template. Uh, it's also great when attacks fail because that uh, says that that template might not work and uh, you've made the bad guys have to do a little bit more work before they will make more money tomorrow. Um, so disclosure of the vulnerabilities and the attacks against us and attackers uh, will make us stronger and it will cost us a little bit of pride. Certainly nobody likes to see their company's name in the headlines. It might affect your stock price if you have one. Uh, it'll affect whether the people here at the uh, Hacklew Social are going to poke fun at you because you didn't have something patched. Uh, so you, you have to swallow all of that because the benefit to you, as reflected through the benefit you can add to the community by sharing those details, is greater than those costs. Um, and it turns out more than just attacks and vulnerabilities, the sharing of baseline telemetry, in other words, stuff that's just happening all the time, is also necessary. You cannot detect anomalies if you don't know what normal looks like. And um, you will, when you're trying to figure out how an attack succeeded, uh, you'll, you need to know what it used, what were the tools and parts of that attack. Um, and that means you need to have knowledge of the whole internet system, not just your firewall, your IDS, your IPS, your, your log files. So again, uh, to, to have any kind of strength in defense, which is, I think, what we're here to do besides drinking, um, we need to uh, figure out how we're going to be sharing the information that describes the activities on our network to our competitors in a way that uh, strengthens us more than it weakens us. Uh, I have a solution. Uh, but before I launch into that solution, I want to say that personally identifiable information uh, should not be collected. I, I realize that in most parts of the world, an employee has no expectation, no reasonable expectation of privacy when they're using their employer's equipment or network, um, and that's outside scope. Uh, what I'm talking about is you're a customer of an ISP. You are a customer of a social networking company. Um, you should have the reasonable expectation that uh, your digital footprints, your digital exhaust, as Dan Gear calls it, uh, is not being monetized to your disadvantage. In other words, there should be a reasonable uh, expectation of privacy when you're using a network that is secured in the way that I recommend securing them. So let me also say that there are an awful lot of attackers now who are state-sponsored or even uh, state. Uh, most of us lack the strength to defend against attacks uh, from a state actor. They have enormously deep pockets. Their power budget uh, is much bigger than ours will ever be. Um, and from their point of view, they're just doing what they need to do to protect their nation or their state in a world where every other state is taking similar actions. They don't want to be the one who said, oh, we're, we're going to rise above all of that because ultimately... Uh, they will lose all kinds of important low-level uh, skirmishes. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, keeping those people from getting my personal information is simply too hard. Um, I realize that there are people in this room who think that that is a practical problem, and I urge you to greater efforts, but uh, I'm not going to be uh, talking about how to collect information in a way that somehow governments don't participate with. So, in 2007... When I was running the Internet Systems Consortium, it's a company I founded in the 90s, um, we decided to uh, create a global network of uh, telemetry collectors. And uh, these collectors, we call them sensors, but uh, to be a sensor sounds like it's a piece of hardware. This isn't hardware, it's just an open source piece of software that you run, in this case, on a name server or nearby a name server where it can see the packets and it looks at those packets and tries to uh, reconstruct transactions out of a packet flow um, and sends it to a hub. So this is very much a hub and spoke model, like the wheel on a bicycle. Um, and at the hub, um, we then made the data available to people that we trusted. And if they wanted to make commercial use, then we charged them. If they weren't making commercial use, we might still charge them. For example, if they were a nonprofit and they were able to pay their power bill and they were able to pay salaries, then they would be paying us something, but not commercial rates. If, on the other hand, they were just an Internet superhero, like about a third of you, and all, you, all they were doing was uh, trying to make the Internet safer, 
and using their own personal time at night to do so, there was ne never a fee for those guys. But um, it worked. We actually got sensors deployed in a lot of places. Uh, in fact, it worked so well that it outgrew ISC, um, and I was very much capital constrained. I could see that there was a lot of um, other solutions in that same barrel that I just could not at uh, attack with the size of the revenue I could create. In other words, this had to pay for itself. I wasn't going for government grant money to fund any of this, and uh, the people who were sending data had absolutely no reason to also send money. So. Um, it became necessary to, to separate this out into a commercial enterprise, Farsight Security, which I incorporated in 2013. So if some of you saw me leave ISC, it was to do this. I have no ties to ISC, although it's the company I founded and ran for 18 years, and so I wish them well. They are still my friends. I just can't do that and this at the same time well. Um, so when we did that, we pulled all the sensors, all the data, all the software, all of the contracts for people who were paying fees out. And now um, everything is eight times larger than it was. Uh, we don't have the venture capital backing, uh, capitalists backing us, so all of this growth is from revenue. Uh, but we are doing a lot more good now than we ever did before. And by the way, people who neither charge a fee for their work nor get paid to do that work still don't pay us anything. So I'm not a nonprofit, but I still recognize that we need to give our sensor operators a, 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 a kind of, some kind of motive. Why, why should I run that software? Why should I send this data to you? Well, let me show you the good works done by all of these people, plus the various commercial people I also sell it to. Uh, so anyway, uh, the nonprofit part of the world is getting more benefit from this than they ever did before. Um, so I appear not to have been one of those sketchy uh, Silicon Valley new tech guys who just wants to let the community build something for him so he can monetize it. Um, yes, I have kids to put through school, but uh, uh, I also want to make a difference in my lifetime, which I think most of you also want to do. Um, good, so I also want to say personally identifiable information is still not welcome. Uh, we don't collect it, and to the extent that it could be reverse engineered out of the things that we do collect, because de-anonymization is an important part of data science, uh, we deliberately file off information that would make that easy. And we also have pretty decent contracts, which are enforceable, by the way, uh, requiring that people not do that kind of uh, de-anonymization. And if they do, they do so at peril of losing their service without getting their money back. So uh, we're doing the best we can. Uh, this is the best that can be done. And what that means, by the way, is that when GDPR came and most of the American tech uh, audience was uh, setting their hair on fire wondering you know, what they could do to stay in business while respecting uh, privacy rights, it was a yawner for us. We were already doing it. So here is a picture similar to the one I showed during the uh, lightning talks last night simply shows the three layers of DNS. The stub resolvers are your laptops and servers and smartphones. The recursives are the true intelligent part of the DNS. Uh, it was probably given, you were probably given a recursive name server address as part of your DHCP transaction to get on the Wi-Fi here. Uh, otherwise, it would be your phone company or you might be using Google for 8.8.8.8. This is where all of the bugs are in DNS. This is where decisions get made. Uh, this is where most of the, I would say 85% of the complexity is in that middle box for recursive servers. But the important part from our point of view is that when you talk to that server, there's personally identifiable information present in those packets. It's your IP address, which can be associated with your MAC address, which can be associated with your person. And so, in a surveillance state, that is where you would want to collect data. And in a non-surveillance company, that is exactly where I don't want to collect data. Um, we collect data that is above all that, literally. So, uh, generally, a recursive server answers quickly using a copy of an answer it has in cache, because somebody before you already wanted to know what www.hack.lu was, and it's, it's still got a copy of that in its heap somewhere. Um, and so most of the transactions that have the PII, um, uh, excuse me, most of the transactions are cache hits. And it's only in the case of a cache miss. You're asking for something novel. 
that nobody else has asked for recently from the same recursive server, and it has to go upstream and talk to whoever runs the servers for .com, which would be VeriSign, or whoever runs the servers for the root name servers, of which I am, I am one. Um, that's where content enters the DNS from outside, normally in the form of a zone file that you're editing with Emacs or Vim or Ed or whatever is your, your preference. You can also generate that data programmatically, as Akamai and Cloudflare and the rest of the CDN world does. Um, so you don't have to have zone files. Uh, anything that answers the question uh, is protocol compliant. So uh, the, the point being that the transactions between the recursive server and the authority server don't include your IP address, and they don't show reuse events. They don't tell, help us understand what was popular. Something might get used a million times, but we will only see one use, or one fetch, because that's all it took <coughs> to get it into the cache. So we put that into the Security Information Exchange, where, among other things, we make a database, which Irina was describing last night in her presentation, and uh, which Alexander and Aaron and I uh, sort of did an impromptu panel on. Uh, that database is hugely important for keeping things secure. Where this is not the only one, but I am committed to running the, the biggest and the best and the fastest and, and, and so on. Um, but importantly, the real-time data is also of great value. You might want to look at the uh, novel domain names, whether it's a delegation point recently sold by GoDaddy or some other registrar, or whether it's a longer, fully qualified name recently created by a sysadmin somewhere. That's a good place to look for your brand name misspelled using IDN characters to confuse it somehow. Um, and we have an awful lot of people, both non-commercial and commercial, who also benefit from the real-time data. So. Um, that's all working, and it's growing, but it wasn't growing here, uh, right? We have some sensors in Europe, <coughs> but even before GDPR, there were companies who were a little concerned about sending data from Europe to California because that's, you know, we know, we know how this ends, Paul. We're not doing it. Okay, I'm not like them. That doesn't matter. We're not doing it. And then GDPR came and offered the perfect excuse, which is, uh, if we do this and we haven't done our own investigation about what PII is, wh who are the data subjects, has their permission been obtained, then we are liable. And uh, so now we're never going to do it. So, yeah, we had a few sensors, but they were universities for the most part. Um, although DCSO, which is a nonprofit, uh, se semi nonprofit in Berlin, is represented in this room. Wave. Um, uh, was also uh, sending us data. But nevertheless, the GDPR problem was really casting a chill over the, our network growth. And, you know, when life gives you lemons, you can make lemonade, which we did. We're essentially monetizing your fear, except there's no money. Um, we created a company in uh, Germany, which is a limited liability company. They call it a UG there. Uh, it has three owners, myself, Christoph Fischer from BFK, and Peter Cruz from CSIS, which is in Denmark. Um, BFK hosts it, and Farsight both develops and operates the software on it. Uh, we do not get any money out of this deal. There is no money to be had. In fact, all of the money in this deal came from my pocket, Peter's pocket, and Christoph's pocket. We're uh, hoping someday to turn this into a GmbH, which is a full-fledged company that has a larger board of directors, and maybe some way to pay the power bills on all of this so that it doesn't come out of BFK's budget. But uh, none of that matters. We are collecting data from European participants, and we're collecting it from within Europe, which means that the other end of these sensor relationships uh, can look at us and say, you're not just in Europe, you're in Germany, which is like got national privacy laws that are even worse than GDPR. We will send the data to you because if it ends up getting misused, you're the one going to jail, not us. And that's fine. As you saw when I created the first anti-spam company in 1996, uh, that's a role I'm comfortable with. Um, so all of the raw data uh, and the filtered data and all of that stuff remains inside the GDPR. Um, we have one deliberate information leak, which is that uh, my company will get to take a copy of this data with all European IP addresses filed off of it and uh, summarized to the point where de-anonymization would be a fool's errand. Um, so we will get to take that back to California, but every other user and use of this will be in Europe. 
Um, what is your benefit? What, what is the cost benefit here? What's your motive? If you give a little, you'll get a lot. If you run a sensor, you will get access to your choice. You can have access to the raw data, in other words, that which all, all other members have also contributed, uh, or you can get access to a stored database, similar to the ones we were demonstrating here last night, but with a shorter time horizon. Uh, when you're running a uh, nonprofit cooperative, you have to be careful not to uh, compete directly with your members. Since a lot of the people that are sharing their data with us have passive DNS databases of their own, we didn't want to make those irrelevant in the market. So we're only going to save the data for a couple of months here. Uh, but even a couple of months of history is of great value to you in either defense or after-action uh, research. Um, but we're not going to uh, redistribute the raw data at all. Uh, it turns out it's not necessary. Uh, so we will be deduplicating it or vectorizing it if you prefer. Uh, in other words, we won't remember, uh, we will never distribute to a member information about what other member was responsible for this transaction. Uh, the, you don't need that information. I can't think of a good reason why you would want it. And so we're not going to, that's not going to occur. We don't store it in the database in any case, but it used to be present in the real time products, won't be present here. Um, so we pre-launched this in March. Uh, we officially launched it October 1st. You may have seen a press release. Uh, it is live now. It is carrying traffic. Um, you should consider whether you or your ISP or your university or whoever you know that runs name servers uh, has got data that Europe would benefit from if the security apparatus of Europe, both the academics and the commercials, could see it. My own judgment is that if the launch point uh, or the destination point of an attack is closely observed by the security industry and the security community, then that attack has a better chance of being prevented in the future. Um, and that is the ultimate reason we're doing all of this. I probably had other things I could have done besides starting this company that would have helped me put my kids through school a little faster. Um, but uh, I've only got some, some number, I don't know what the number is, but some number of days of my life remaining to me, and I'm not going to spend any of them in a way that does not also move the needle on human history. So that's why I do this. And that's my talk, and I'm hoping for questions. Thank you. Um, so I agree with all you said about the importance of sharing information. But for me, I think the solution has to be decentralized. Because for me, like for vulnerability, for IOC, if we don't have a decentralized solution, uh, there is always the risk that a company or a state entity will misuse information. And we need to bring trust to the network. Like for instance, there is um, a protocol called Activity Pub, which is used currently for uh, replacing social network, like for Twitter with Mastodon or YouTube with Peertub. So I wanted to have your opinion on uh, is decentralization important or not? So I am not a fan of unnecessary centralization. Um, as an example, when email stopped uh, working, when mailing lists stopped working, it was because there were so many email providers like Yahoo um, that uh, things like SPF would just break because the mailing lists used to put the sender of each message's address into the from header, which then would be a lie because it was coming from a mailing list expander. Um, and so they simply started changing the definition and the protocols around mailing lists so that we could have enormous email providers. I would have chosen a different way out of that particular conundrum. Um, however, there are cases where centralization uh, is actually necessary. For example, DKICs. Uh, it's very difficult to make an internet exchange happen unless you have a concentration, in other words, a, a hub-and-spoke model, of connectivity. Everybody builds capacity toward a single point, which is the internet exchange, and then within that point they have relatively cheap costs for interconnecting with each other. Uh, if we had to do it building with a hairball style, where each uh, member had a direct connection to the other members, uh, it, we could not have an internet today. So that's a case where centralization is actually called for. Now, um, 
There are a couple of technical reasons why uh, decentralized sharing of this kind does not work at scale. In particular, we're currently seeing 200,000 cache misses per second, and there is no TCP-based protocol that can handle that, and there is nobody anywhere who is willing to provision enough capacity to carry it. So uh, that would be a technical reason, but there's uh, a, a much less tractable problem as well, which is the legal problem. Um, if you want to share your data in a way that you are protected against liability from maybe your customers, because they are responsible for creating some of that data, uh, or your uh, maybe your shareholders, because your competitors are going to be seeing some of that data, if you want to protect yourself, and let me let you know that everybody does want to protect themselves, then you're going to have a contract. Um, and that contract will be enforceable and will have uh, what's called recourse. In other words, if you do not uh, take care of your end of this contract, then I have rights. I can recover my damages. Uh, it turns out that if you wanted, oh, I don't know, 80 uh, passive DNS sensor operators, to share data with each other and an additional 40 people who need to see the data and they can do good with it, but they are not, uh, they don't have any data to trade for it. Uh, you're, you're talking about 80 squared contracts. You're, you're asking each one of these people to negotiate fine print with 79 others. That will never happen. And so in this case, the clearinghouse is not just for the data, but it's also for the liability. People sometimes, before they will sign up to be a sensor, or even before they'll sign up to be a customer, they want to see the sensor agreement that everybody else was required to sign so that they know what kinds of liability they're letting themselves in for. Um, so, again, I am no friend of uh, reactionary centralization that's not necessary, but in this case it really was. Um, and uh, the people who think that this problem can be solved with uh, whatever 0MQ and other TCP solutions uh, are welcome to contact me and let, uh, I will explain sort of what we're doing with UDP broadcast and why and how. Other questions? It seems there are no more questions. Well, thank you, Paul. We break early for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>